Praise God. Welcome to Almost Midnight, giving God all the honor and glory as we um, return to the book of Revelation, as we study the book of Revelation and look at it and understand it. We are now in chapter 9 of that book. Amen. And we will be um, concluding um, chapter 9 tonight. This will be part 2. Amen. Glory to God. So just giving God all the honor, the praise, and the glory. Amen. For what he is doing. Amen. So I'm trying to lift this up because that seems to be capturing that. Amen. Praise God. So I'm just so happy to be here. Amen. Tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. So just saying welcome to my Facebook family, to all of you who have been following on this teaching on the book of Revelation, going chapter by chapter. Oh, praise God, Sister Annette. It's so wonderful to have you on. I saw you on We Got the Power with my son, Chief Apostle King Larry. That was an awesome message. And so also to those of um, that remnant family, not only on Facebook and in the four corners of the earth, but also on YouTube, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave a comment. Amen. And all oh, praise God, Torianne. It's so wonderful to have you on tonight. Amen. Glory to God. And so let us pray in. Amen. Well, Lord God, in the mighty name of Jesus, just giving you all the honor, the praise, and the glory, and thanking you, Lord God, for this time of fellowship. Holy Ghost, just thanking you for all revelation and understanding. Amen. Thanking you that you are so faithful in your word. You said that you would teach us all things and show us things to come and guide us into all truth. And Lord, Holy Spirit, just go before this teaching. Touch the hearts, the minds, and the spirit of your people, Lord God. You said that the husbandmen must be the first partaker of the fruit, and Lord, let it begin with me. So, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we adore you, and we seal it in the blood. Amen and amen. Well, praise God, beloved. Amen. Praise God, my son Paulson. It's so wonderful to see you on. Amen. Oh, wow. Wow, that's such a blessing. Amen. And so once again, beloved, we are going to um, go back to um, chapter 9 of the book of Revelation. And I just want to read through it. We're not going to repeat it. Amen. Um, because anyone that missed part 1 can go back and look at part 1, which is um, already posted. Amen. So I just want to begin um, at Revelation chapter 9, verse 7. And I just want to remind everyone that we are now looking at the uh, last three trumpets that are blown, and these all come with a woe. And oh my goodness, on Monday, we looked at that first woe, and it was devastating. Amen. And so, you know, each of those woes um, become more and more devastating. This is one of the hardest chapters to hear. Amen. Um, because it is so devastating. Praise God to my cousin Debbie. And so I'm just going to read. I'm not going to do a review. Amen. Beginning at verse 7. It's um, because now um, when this trumpet was sounded, locusts were released into the earth. And it says, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. On their heads, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women and their teeth as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like scorpions and there were stings in their tails. And it 
stung and their power was to hurt men for five months and we're coming back here because it says in verse 11 and they had a king over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in hebrew in the hebrew tongue is abaddon but in the Greek tongue has the name of Polyon. Amen. So once again, beloved, before we go further, I just want to remind everyone who this is. Who is it talking about in Revelation chapter 9, verse 11? This king that is over these demonic um, entities that have been released from the pit of hell. Who is it? None other than Satan. Satan himself. Amen. And, you know, I almost forgot. I want to make sure that um, I can see your comments. Um and so I just want to check um, the Facebook page on um, my laptop um, to make sure that I can see your comments because it's so important, beloved, that, um, you know, if anyone has a question or if anyone needs me to slow down, amen, that um, I can slow down and answer a question. Amen. So I'm trying to see why I don't actually see. Oh, here's the video so I can see any comments that come on. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. And getting back to it, the one is called the angel of the bottomless pit. Amen. So once again, what are we talking about? We're talking about Satan being the king over them. Because once again, look at it. It says, and they had a what? A king over them. And what is a king? A king is someone who has the rulership and the dominion over a kingdom. Amen. And hell is Satan's kingdom. We are told, and let's just back this up with some scripture. We are told in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 that Satan is what? The little G-O-D, the God of this world. Um, and then when we look at Revelation 20, which we haven't gotten to, but if we look at verses 10, verse 14, and verse 15, amen, this is how it reads. It says, and the devil that deceived them were cast where? Into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire with him. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Praise God. Oh, amen. Um, Pastor Silas. And so it says what in verse 10? So now we know that the name of Polyon and also that name of Baton is speaking about Satan. Um, just like he has many names, the devil, amen, Satan, um, the destroyer, amen. And those two names actually mean what? Destroyer. Abaddon and Apollyon means destroyer, amen. And we have to remember that Satan is what? A fallen angel when he was named what? Lucifer before he got kicked out of heaven. We see in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, um, in that in, in the NIV, rather than be called Lucifer, his name is called what? The morning star and son of the dawn, the um, morning, amen? And so it's really important that we remember that this, um, angel is a fallen angel and it's called the angel of the pit. The angel means that it's a specific angel. It doesn't say an angel, which would mean one angel out of many. The angel is very specific. Amen. And we have to remember the word of God teaches us that Satan comes but what? To steal, to kill, 
and destroy. Amen. And there is something that we very rarely look at when we talk about tithing. Amen. Because in Malachi 3, we are told to bring all our tithes into the storehouse that there might be meat in our house. Right? But when we look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 11, what does the Lord promise us? There's a promise inside of Malachi 3.11 when we pay our tithes. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer. Who is Satan? The devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts. Beloved, when we pay our tithes, we also get a promise from God that the enemy, the devourer, Satan, the devil, um, Abaddon, Apollyon, the devourer, shall not be able what to devour our finances or what we prosper in or the fruit of our labor. Amen. And so one Woe is past. That is when these locusts come up out of the earth, amen, and two more woes are going to come, and they get exceedingly worse each time. So let's look, starting at verse 12, amen, and now this is part two of chapter nine. It says, one woe is past, one woe, and behold, there come two woes more afterwards. So two more woes are coming. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. It says the sixth angel. And we know that um, in numbers, praise God, prophetess Shaniqua, that the number six represents what? Flesh. Amen. And it says that the sixth angel sounded and it says, and I heard from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And we're not going to do a study on that tonight, but these four horns represents power. Amen. And the norm number four represents what? The creative power of God in the earth. So now we're hearing this come forth, this angel sounded from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God saying to this sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Amen. And now some of us have heard this um, name before in the book of Genesis, especially the great river Euphrates. Amen. And so listen at this. It says that when the trumpet blows, Loose, that means that they are bound. Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now, these are four angels. These are fallen angels. Amen. Because they are bound. They are in what? The great river Euphrates. Now, where is the um, river Euphrates? It starts in Turkey, flows southeast across Syria and through Iraq. And we, um, I don't know if you know, but as we look more at the book of Revelation, we look at the end times, what do we know? That this, um, all of this action is gonna happen mostly in the Middle East. Amen, talking about the end, the last war. A lot of the uh, destruction is centered around the Middle East because of Israel, who is right there. Amen, the land of Israel. And there are many countries surrounding Israel, amen, that are going to be warring against the land of Israel. And so Iraq is going to be very involved. Right now, there is what? A battle between Israel and Palestine. Amen. Russia and Ukraine. But one of the things that people are very concerned about and watching over is the fact that Iraq is 
um, being drawn into this battle. Amen. And especially those theologians and people who really understand a lot about the end times, they're concerned about Iraq being drawn in. But beloved, it is not time yet. There are so many things that have to happen before the end time. And I want to remind everyone that the church first has to be raptured, right? And so, um, the um, war, that battle of Armageddon, all of that cannot take place until after the church is raptured. Amen. So even though that's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, right, verse 6, there shall be wars and rumors of wars. There are going to be actual wars, but there's also going to be suspicion and rumors that wars are going to happen. Amen. He says, but see that you be not troubled, for the end is not yet. It's not the end yet, beloved. The church still has to be um, raptured. And before the church can be raptured, what has to happen? Those of you who have been following know that the Antichrist has to be revealed. And those two things have not happened yet. Amen. So what do we know about the river Euphrates? We see it mostly in the book of Genesis because this is really um, so um, um, thought provoking is that number one, according to the Bible, um, this um, river Euphrates and other rivers are close to what? The Garden of Eden. That is where mankind started. That is where mankind fell. That is where sin entered into the world when Adam and Eve sinned against God. Amen? So this is where the Euphrates River is, where Pishon is also. And I just want to see if I can read for you um, that verse. I'm going to read Genesis chapter 2, verse 14. And it says, it says, I'm, no, no, I'm going to start in verse 11. No, verse 10. It says, and a, rev, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The first is Pishon, which it is compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And two, and the gold of the land is good. Then verse 13 says, and the name of the second river is Gihon, and the same is that that compasses the whole land of what? Ethiopia. So we know that um, the Garden of Eden is not only around a rock in the Middle East, but around Africa. Amen? And it says, and it is Hideko, that is it which goeth towards the east of Assyria, and the fourth is the Euphrates. Amen? And so all of these rivers are around Eden. And once again, Eden is where, praise God, Apostle Lungi, it's so wonderful have you on, to have you on. So we're looking at what is going to be the end of days. It's going to be in the very place where mankind began, around Africa and the Middle East. Amen. And so what does this say? In Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, what? The first murder takes place. Cain slew um, Abel. Then also, according to the Bible, what? Also in this same area was the Tower of Babel. Amen? And that was between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Amen? And so we see that um, God began mankind in this beautiful place called the Garden of Eden, but when mankind was kicked out he and he fell, he was still in that general area of Ethiopia, of Turkey, of Syria, of Iraq. And so now in the end times, 
we're going right back to that region in the earth. Amen. So it's really important for us to know who are these um, four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And, you know, Prophetess Shaniqua, Sister Annette, um, Sister Torian, um, after, I mean, try to remember to remind me to do a teaching on the angels amen because there are two different sets of fallen angels amen and we can't get into it tonight amen even though i've hit and talked about it in the past there needs to be a separate teaching on why there are two different sets of fallen angels because we are looking at revelation chapter 9 we're talking about these four thank you so much we're talking about four angels which are bound that mean in chains in what the great river euphrates and they've been there for a very long time so even though we can't go into it today there are two different sets now the first set and you just i'm um, gonna have to um look up the chapters and the verses that i give you on your own time and when i do the teaching you'll be prepared amen now let's look at satan who was kicked out of heaven along with what? A third of the angels. We will find that, amen, in Revelation chapter 12, amen. And I'm going to read just a little bit of that. I'm going to go over there tonight. Um, and it's all very symbolic. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, verse 4, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, and 12. I'm going to just read these verses. This is the fall of Satan. This is when Satan got kicked out of heaven. And remember, a lot of it is symbolism. He's the dragon. He's called the dragon. Amen? In this um mostly in revelation 12 it says about satan and his tail when he was lucifer and got kicked out of heaven and became that dragon the devil and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born so this is just simply saying that when lucifer was in heaven when he rebelled against god um, with a third of the angels in an insurrection against Almighty God, he got kicked out of a, out of heaven along with a third of the angels. And it says in verse seven, and there was a war in heaven. Michael, the that's the archangel, the head warrior angel in God's army. Michael and his angels fought against who the dragon satan and his angels amen um and it says and the dragon fought against his angels and he did not prevail neither was there a place found him in heaven anymore so that's when the war took place when satan he became so prideful he wanted to assume the throne of god he wanted to even go above god amen and then it says in verse 9 and the great dragon was cast out he was thrown out called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Can you believe it, beloved? Uh, he convinced a third of God's angels to side with him against God and they were all kicked out. And so verse 12 says, therefore rejoice you heavens because he was kicked out and 
you that dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, but he has a short time. Amen. And so that's the first set of angels. These are angels that were kicked out of heaven. Why? For rebelling against God, for turning against God, who had that kind of pride and arrogance because, beloved, there is a glory of God upon them. There are powers that are bestowed upon angels. Amen. That's why many times when people encounter angels, they want to bow because of the glory of God. And once again, I want to remind you that the glory of God is very weighty. The glory of God is very powerful. So many times people want to bow before the angels. So they have powers. Amen. And once they became fallen, amen, fallen angels, they became the demons that we battle against. Amen. These are demonic spirits, principalities, and um, wicked powers that are in the earth and that is that um is in the second heaven amen because remember satan is what the prince of the air so um they are also in the atmosphere amen but these angels these four angels are a different group of angels amen these angels are angels angels that did not get kicked out of heaven they chose to leave heaven and the reason why i have to do a a long teaching on these two groups is because it's very rarely taught um these angels in genesis in the chapter in the sixth chapter of genesis verse two and three this is what it says this is where these four angels that are loose, amen, that are bound in the river Euphrates, they are part of these angels that left heaven of their own accord because they wanted to leave heaven, and it's shocking as to why they left. And in um, Genesis chapter 6, they are called what? Sons of God. And if we look at the book of Job, the Lord is telling me to turn over to the book of Job for a minute. Because if you remember in the book of Job, when um, Job was going through all of the challenges and the adversity that he was going through. We, if you remember that Satan confronted God about Job and the Lord asked Job, um, have you um, tested my son Job? Amen. But I want you to see that sons of, that they were called sons of God. Amen. The angels were called sons of God. It says in Job chapter one, verse six. Now there, and this, I want you to read for yourself, beloved. It says in Job chapter one, verse six and seven. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. These, this is when angels were also called sons of God. And the Lord said unto Satan, where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro um, in the earth and walking up and down it. So now back to these angels in Genesis chapter 6. This is how it reads. It says that the sons of God, the angels of God, some of them saw the daughters of men. All right, so you got angels in heaven looking down on the daughters of men in the earth that they were fair, that they were beautiful. And they took them wives of which they chose. Then in verse 3, it says, The Lord warns them by saying, My spirit shall not always strive with man, 
because he is also flesh and his days are short. They are not eternal like yours and they shall be 120 years. Amen. So the Lord is warning these angels that are in heaven that are looking down. Praise God, Bishop Arono. Um, what an honor. Praise God, um, my sister, um, Pastor Florence. God is warning these angels that are lusting with their eyes by looking at the daughters of men on the earth. And it says they chose and took the women that they wanted. And the Lord is saying to them, you are eternal. You have eternal bodies. You get to live for eternity. If you do this thing, you have to understand that human beings are only going to live for a certain amount of time on the earth and that there is going to come a time when um, the life of mankind on the earth is going to end. And the Lord warns them, but they do it anyway. These are that other set of angels that are bound in chains. Um, it says in the book of Jude, Jude is only one chapter, amen, verse six. And this is where it talks about them again. It says, and the angels which did not keep their first estate. In other words, they left it says, but they left their habitation. In other words, they left on their own accord. They were not kicked out like the third of the angels. These are angels that decided that they wanted to come to earth because of the women. It says, and it says, and I'm going to read the whole verse. And the angels which did not keep their first estate, the place where they dwelled from the beginning in heaven, but left their own habitation, left the place um, where they were meant to be. It says he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the day, the great day. So there are more angels that are bound. Amen. But these four are being least released um, in order for this second woe um, to take place. Now, did you notice that it says that they will be held in chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day? That, that means, beloved, that angels are going to be judged. And this is something that I hope you will know, is that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, the word of God tells us what? Don't you know that you shall judge angels? Amen. And so, beloved, the Lord is letting us know that we will be judging along with him angels who chose to leave heaven and come to earth. And so going back to verse 15, it says, and the four angels, I hope everyone was able to follow that. We're talking not about the um, fallen angels that were kicked out of heaven along with Lucifer who became Satan, the dragon, the devil, amen. We're talking about the angels who left their estate, amen, because they desired the women that were on the earth, amen, praise God, all right, and so it says in verse 15, and the four angels were loosed, that means that the bounds, the chains that were on them were loosed off of them, which were prepared, listen at this, for an hour and a day, and a month and a year for to slay the third of man. Look how precise God is. Amen. And I mean, I want you to hear this. The Lord is saying that these angels were prepared for such a time as this. 
for the second woe to be from the pit of hell to be loosed in the earth. What does this say? The, the Lord prepared them for the hour, the day, the month, the year to what? Kill, slay a third part of mankind. So the law is very specific. One year, one month, one day, and one hour. That they were given to slay what? A third, to kill a third part of mankind. Now, a third of mankind will be killed. Now, let's look at Praise God, Prophetess Monique. It's so wonderful to have you on. You're in Kenya, glory to God. Amen. Now, let's look at how many people are on the earth right now, beloved. There are about 8 billion people on the earth right now. There's 8.25 billion people on the earth. We have to remember now that in Revelation chapter 6, Verse 7 and 8, Revelation chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, the fourth seal was opened, and that pale horse came forth, and the one that sat on that pale horse was what? Caught, was death and hell followed him, and power was given unto him over what? A fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger and death, and with the beast of the earth. That means that that happened before the time we are looking at. Amen? So he was given what? Hell, death was given the power to what? Kill what? One fourth, a whole quarter of the people on the earth. All right? So that means that what? One quarter of the people have died. I'm talking about up until this time now. One quarter of the people would have died when that pale horse was released. Amen? And that means that what? There would be about 6 billion people left. Amen? But um, the number of people on the earth is what? diminishing. Then we got to remember that once the Antichrist is revealed, that the church is going to be raptured. So there's about right now 2 billion people who are professed Christians. And we pray that most of these 2 billion people will make it into heaven that will be raptured with God. Amen. But remember I told you there will be some saints that are left because they choose to stay. And then there are people who might have professed Christ with their lips, but they never served God. They never um, believed in God. They never... Um, walked with God or had a personal relationship. Amen. They just said one day that they believe um, in Christ. We're not talking about them. We're not even talking about a lukewarm walk. So now we had gone down to 6 billion people right after that quarter of the peoples on the earth were killed. Now we got two what billion more people that are raptured. So now half, half, beloved, half of the people on the earth are gone. One quarter has been killed, which is about 2,000. Then another quarter, about another quarter is raptured. So now you only have about half of the people left in the earth. Amen? And so now we see we are being told what that out of all the people that are left that there is going to be what a third of the people now that are going to be killed out of these four um billion people amen and that's the third of the four billion is about 1.3 billion people that are going to be killed this time. Amen? Um, let's look at that verse. It says in verse 17, And thus I saw the horses in the vision. 
and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and of brimstone and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone by these three was the third part of men killed by fire and smoke and brimstone which issued out of their mouths amen and so it's really important beloved that we know that the things that are coming for these demonic principalities and spirits that are being unleashed in the earth amen is not something mankind has ever seen before. It's not something that we can even conceive of. Amen? Um, because it says that what they look like. It says the shape. I'm going to go back to 7, um, 8, 9, and 10. It says, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Their heads were as crowns like gold, and their faces were as faces of men. They had the hair of women, and their teeth was as the teeth of lion. They had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there was things in their tails and their power was what to hurt men for five months amen and they had a king over them which is satan amen but now what are we looking at that woe is past if we thought that was past now we have something worse we have these four angels that have been loosed out of the euphrates amen and the way it is described, what they do unto mankind. God has prepared them for a specific hour, for a day, for a month, and for a year. So in other words, that these four angels that are loose are going to be devastated to people in the earth for a year, a month, a day, and an hour. God is very, very specific. And it tells us how people will be killed. Amen? Um, it says that the number of the army of these horsemen were 200 thousand and i heard a number of them but before we get to this army let's just look at them once again when they are loosed what are they going to do they are going to destroy mankind they're going to have one year one month one day and one hour to destroy a third of mankind amen and it is going to be painful beloved and just imagine one of the things that we talked about on monday was that yes it sounds hard yes it sounds as if it's just um the lord pouring out his wrath but beloved that is not so God is trying to reach people who have the most hardened hearts. God is trying to reach people who are stubborn in their sin, people who refuse to bow to God, people who refuse to acknowledge that he is God, that he holds eternity in his hands. Amen? Because everyone that is born from Adam until the time that Christ returns, amen, everyone will have an eternity, either an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. God is giving people on earth an opportunity, the ones that have hardened hearts, the ones that are prideful um, and stand firm in their uh, rebellion against God. God is still reaching out. God could just destroy 
destroy the entire earth, but he is still reaching out to the hearts that can be pierced. He's still reaching out to the prideful ones that can be humble. He is still reaching out to the ones that are so stubborn that they begin to bend and say, oh my goodness, I cannot Fight against God. God is God alone and there is no God beside him and surrender their lives unto him. Unto him. It seems harsh, beloved, but there are people who are so stubborn. There are people who are so hardened in their hearts. There are people, and we all know people like that, who refuse to admit that they were wrong. All of us know that kind of person, where the person, no matter what the evidence, no matter what you say, they will not acknowledge that they were wrong, even though they know that they are wrong. There will be people on this earth who said that there was no God out of anger, out of disappointment, out of being frustrated with life. They will repent refuse to say that there's a God. It's not that they don't believe there's a God, but they're so angry. They're so bitter. They are so hardened in their hearts. They're so frustrated by life. They're so um, devastated by things in their life. Even though deep down inside, they know there's a God, they refuse to say it out of their stubbornness. Amen. And so God is trying to reach those people. Beloved, that is mercy. Beloved, that is grace um, reaching out. That is the love of God. And once again, I want to remind you that God did not send his only begotten son. Who is God? Jesus Christ, Yeshua is God. Amen. He did not send him to condemn the world. As it says in John 3, um, 17 and 18. Amen. And I'm going to turn over to John chapter 3, 17 and 18. What does it say? It says, <clears throat> I got to turn over one more. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, that through him the world might be saved. Amen. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that does not believe is condemned already because what? He did not believe on the only, on the name, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Christo. Um, on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then verse 19 says, this is the condemnation, that light came into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They love darkness so that they can do evil and wickedness. Amen? And so we see that we have people who are stubbornly refusing, amen, to worship God. And then that's the second woe. A third of the people have been killed. Amen. How? By fire, by brimstone, amen, and by smoke. Amen. And then we go down to verse 16, I think. Yes, verse 16. It says, and, and now this army, this mighty army is coming forth. And when people hear the number of this army, most of the time people automatically assume it's an army from one country and people usually assume it's China. It says, and the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand and i heard the number of them so this time john heard the number of how many were in this army two hundred thousand thousand 
and but this is not china amen um this is a huge army that will come together under the antichrist remember that the antichrist is in the earth that peoples all over the earth have agreed and surrendered to take the mark of the beast except for who beloved do we remember the ones who have been sealed by god amen and who are those people amen it's the jews who are in physical israel who have been sealed by god amen um and the lord promises that the wrath that takes place in the world will not touch them who else there are also um children of the lost tribes of israel in the four corners of the earth that have been scattered in the four corners of the earth they don't even know that they are of the tribes of israel but god knows who they are amen and they are sealed and then you have who else god's remnant also um people who have chosen to stay here amen they are sealed amen because they choose to stay um to witness in the latter days to bring people to christ to still um preach the gospel amen and so we have those okay so now we see this large army that is under the antichrist and remember that the antichrist it tells us in revelation chapter 13 that he has power over all peoples in the earth amen who do not have the mark um who do not who do not have the seal of god let's look at revelation chapter 13 verse 16 it says and the antichrist he gives what he causes all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads amen so he has power over all these people and he's gonna have people in his army all over the earth and it says um the lord says this is um what this army looks like it says and in verse 17 and thus i saw horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jason and of brimstone and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone by these three was the third part of men killed by these, these three things fire smoke and brimstone which came out of the mouths out of their mouths amen and verse that's about beloved 1.3 billion people that will be killed this way amen and then we still have what people that's left over now beloved this is um well first let me read verse 19. it says for their power is in their mouth fire brim um smoke and brimstone and in their tails for their tails were like unto serpents now beloved we know that snakes and serpents are poisonous because of the venom in their mouth not in their tails but the thing about it is why would the lord say um and in their tails for their power is in their mouth fire smoke and brimstone and in their tails for their tails were like unto serpents amen so beloved we serve a supernatural god so there's going to be some kind of power inside their tails but also one of the things that sometimes people mistakenly try to do 
if they see a snake, is to try to grab it by its tail. But if you try to grab a, a snake or a serpent by its tail, very often, if you try to do that, then the head of that serpent will come around and sting you. Amen? And so what we are talking about is something never seen in the earth before. Amen? And it says, now this is so sad, beloved. It says in verse 20, and the rest of the men, the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands. The people who were left did not repent of the work of their hands. The first part that is so sad, in spite of everything they see, in spite of all the calamity, in spite of all the devastating things that are happening in the earth, although over a half of the people on the earth have died or um, two billion have been raptured into heaven and all these people are missing. Um, the grass have been burnt up. Uh, um, there's been blood in the sea where a third of the water is destroyed, where the fish and the animals in the sea has been destroyed, where animals are attacking people from the famine and from the hunger because crops have been destroyed. All of these things are taking place. Plus now the Antichrist is showing who he really is, and there's bloodshed everywhere. Amen? And he's exerting his power in the earth, yet, after seeing all these things, after seeing people who were tormented for five months by the sting of these scorpions who begged to die, but it says that death would flee from them. They wanted to die. They begged to die, but they could not die even though they felt these things they what it says that they refuse what to repent it says and the rest of the men not just men beloved but women we're talking about what mankind mankind so the rest of the men and women on the earth which were not killed by all those plagues we have looked at in Revelation chapter um, 7, Revelation chapter 8, Revelation verse um, chapter 9, they would not repent of the work of their hands, that they should not, what, worship devils, amen, or idols of gold or silver or brass and stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Amen. I want to read a verse to you from Isaiah, and it's time to close. Isaiah 59, verse 3. It says in Isaiah 59, verse 3, talking about people who refuse to repent of the work of their hands. It says, for your hands are the file with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perverseness. Amen. Beloved, there are so many people in this world when it talks about people who refuse to repent because of the work of their hands. Amen. There are people who are using their hands to hurt and to harm people and do not feel any kind of remorse, don't feel bad about it. You know, God is not just talking about hands that kill people. He's talking about hands of iniquity. We're talking about people also who write legislation and laws that oppress people, that takes the rights of people people away that put people under um, subjection to um, uh, policies and to administrations and to governments that 
trample over God's people, God is not pleased. Amen? People think that because they are in seats of power as a king, as a uh, as a king or as a queen or as a president or as um, some form of authority, a dictator or some authoritarian figure, people think because they enact laws that forces themselves upon people and tramples tram, tramples upon people's rights what they don't understand amen is that god is watching and that a lot of these people that are being hurt and harmed by these policies that refuse to give people the things that they need that try to harm people that god is looking at these things it's the it's the stroke of a pen is using the laptop and typing um, letters on a computer, but God is saying what you are doing, you know that it is wicked. You know that it is evil. You know that it is hurting and harming people and damaging people. Amen. And so God um, wants us to understand what it means and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, they did not repent of the work of their hands, not just violence, not just bloodshed, but when they can use their hands to harm other people and hurt other people, why? for the love of money, for wealth, amen, and for power. There are people that will trample on other people for wealth and for power. And God says, even though they saw all of these things, they still did not repent of the works of their hands, the things that they did that was evil and wicked with their own hands, that they should not, what, worship devils. There are people that gave and began to um, worship Satan and witchcraft, amen, and voodoo and all kinds of um, satanic um, rituals, God is saying they would not repent, even though they could clearly see that God Almighty had more power than the, the demons and Satan and the witches and the witchcraft, they still would not humble themselves and repent. Neither would those who worship idols made of gold and silver and brass and stone that could neither see nor hear nor walk. And then verse 21, which is the last verse says, neither did they repent of their murders. Beloved, see, that shows you that in verse 20, God is not just talking about using one's hands to physically murder someone. Amen? But you can almost take someone's life by saying that some people deserve medical care and some people don't. Some people deserve um, to get help and some people don't. Some people People, um, you know, you can just legislate, amen, um, someone's rights away as a human being, amen. Um, we look at third world countries where so many women are hung and burned and killed, amen, um, for um, their hair, um, being shown or because they were caught in adultery, amen. And it says in verse 21, they did not repent of their murders. They did not repent of their sorceries. And what is sorcery? Sorcery is, a, is witchcraft, but sorcery is an attempt to go past God and, excuse me, and God's power and gain power through Satan instead. So uh, people want to go past God who gives us these gifts and want to go to Satan and 
give glory to Satan instead. Amen. So they didn't repent of their murders. They didn't repent of their sorceries and witchcraft and voodoo and roots and Santeria. They did not repent of that. Nor, now beloved, I told you that when this is over, the Lord said that I have to do a teaching on holiness and righteousness. It says, nor did they repent of their fornication. Fornication beloved fornication look, look is what's on this list there are four things murders sorceries fornication and theft fornication is a big deal amen we might not think it's a big deal because the world thinks it's okay the world says it's okay for us to sleep this person with another who is unmarried, to shack up, you know, to have a, a, a sexually intimate relationship with someone outside of marriage. I'm not talking about, beloved, when we fall into sin. All of us have fallen into sin. All of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. But God is talking about people who know to do right, and refuse to do it and kind of say to God, I don't care about your law. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I'm going to continue to fornicate even in the midst of all this devastation. It didn't even put a reverential fear in of the Lord in their hearts. Amen. So beloved, God didn't even put in here adultery. What God put in was fornication because this fornication we take too lightly. We feel like we can just sleep with whoever we want when we want and it's okay with God because it's okay with the world. But God is the one that set the standard. God sets the standard and he's not going to lower his standard for anyone. God is talking about willful sin. God is not talking about all of his children who made that mistake in the past and was fornicating and realized that we were wrong and we repented and turned from our wicked way. No, no. God is saying they refuse to repent for their murders, refuse to repent for the sorcery and witchcraft and santeria and roots and voodoo. They refuse to repent for fornicating and they refuse to repent for stealing and for theft. Beloved, it's not just about stealing money. Amen. It's also about stealing people's rights, stealing things from people that don't belong to them. Amen. Robbing people of things. And so, beloved, this is where we're going to end. All God is asking from for from people is to repent when we repent it means to turn it doesn't mean to just say i'm sorry it means that my heart is broken lord because i recognize and realize how i have sinned against you i recognize my filthiness i recognize my sin i recognize how i have dishonored you and lord please forgive me and mean it. All these people had to do, beloved, to be saved was to repent. But it says that in spite of all the plagues, all of the things that had happened, all of the bloodshed, all of the suffering, all of the supernatural manifestations of demonic activity that has been loosed into the earth, people, there are are people who were so wicked and dark in their hearts, so hardened and so um, in love with darkness that they would rise up their fists against God and curse God rather than to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. The word of God teaches us, beloved, 
that there is nothing, nothing, nothing that we cannot be forgiven of except for blaspheming the Holy Ghost. God is saying, I was, I was willing to forgive them for what? For the uh, work of their hands, the wicked, evil work of their hands. I was reaching out and willing to forgive them for worshiping devils. I was willing and reaching out my hand to what? Forgive them for worshiping idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood that cannot breathe, that cannot walk, that cannot speak. I was willing to forgive them for their murders. I was willing to forgive them for their sorceries and their witchcraft and Santeria and voodoo and, and um, other satanic practices. I was willing to forgive them for their habitual fornication, for their willful fornication in my face in spite of seeing all of this. I was willing to forgive them for the lying, for the stealing, for the thievery, but they refused to repent. And so, beloved, there is gonna come a time where repentance can no longer come forth from the mouth of a person and it have an impact. There is going to come a time where the window is shut. When we think about um, the 10 virgins and five of them were wise and five of them were foolish, the five wise virgins were prepared. They got themselves ready. They had their oil. They had their anointing. The way we get the anointing, beloved, is in the presence of God. By spending time with God, the anointing comes from God. God. And they were prepared. Why? Because they were in the presence of God. They had a deep relationship with God and they allowed God to do the necessary work to get them ready for his coming. Amen. And so God, but the five foolish virgins, they had no oil. Amen. And when they got to the door, the bridegroom did not open the door back up because the door had been closed. And this is the verse I'm going to end with. It's in chapter 22 of Revelations. I'm going to read verse 11, 12, and 13. It says in Revelation 22, starting at verse 11, this is letting us know, beloved, when Christ comes back, if we are filthy, we're going to stay filthy. We're not going to change from filthy to clean. If, if Christ comes back and we are wicked, we're going to stay wicked. It says, when he comes back in that moment, he that is unjust, if there is injustice in that person's heart, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him stay filthy. He that is righteous, let him stay righteous. He that is holy, let him stay holy. He says, behold, pay attention, be aware. I will come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. If our work is for the Lord and for good, our reward is good. If our work is for Satan and for darkness and evil, our reward will be for that. Amen. And then he says in 13, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So beloved, this is the conclusion of chapter 9 of Revelation. Amen. This is one of the hardest um, chapters to read, to hear, because of all the calamity and the devastation and the suffering and the pain that is taking place in this chapter. Beloved, but I want to remind you that as hard as it looks, as harsh as it looks, God only um, utilized a portion of his power. 
amen, a third of his power. Amen. Because God's mercy and love and grace was still reaching out to people. Um, he was really crying out to people, right? Because God wishes that none would perish, but all souls would live. But beloved, it is clear from John um, chapter 3, um, 17, 18, and 19, that some people love darkness rather than light. Amen? And so we're going to end here and be encouraged, beloved. I just thank God for you. I thank God for his remnant seed in the four corners of the earth. I thank God that God chose you before the foundation of the world. I praise God that there's nothing that can stop or block what God has purposed to do in your life. I praise God that you were chosen for such a time as this. Praise God, my son, Chief Apostle King Larry. I praise God that we serve the one and only true and living God who sits on the throne with all power in his hands. I praise God that we have a mind, a heart, and a spirit that is open to hear what the spirit is saying to his church. I praise God that God has a people that he is filling, who he is conforming to the image of his son so that he can be glorified in the earth. I praise God for you tonight. I praise God that God is connecting his remnant in the four corners of the earth. Amen. Because when we look around, we don't always see people who are in love with God, who are willing, amen, to go all the way for God, who want God more than everything, whose whole heart is turned towards God, who love God with all their heart, their mind, their soul, their strength and might. Amen. But you are those people. So let us pray out praising God for you tonight. And we praise God for God that we He we can't even come unless he draw us and that he drew us, amen. So Lord God, in the mighty name of Jesus, just giving you all the honor, the praise and the glory. Thanking you, Lord God, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, that even in the darkest times, your light, still shines through, that even when men's hearts and minds of spirit are hardened against you, turned against you, are stubbornly resistant to you, you still reach out with an outstretched hand, with an outstretched arm in your perfect love, your perfect grace and your perfect mercy. Lord God, we thank you that you are perfect in all your ways. I thank you, Lord, tonight for your remnant seed in the four corners of the earth, for every remnant that is present tonight. I ask you to pour out a special blessing upon them tonight, dear Lord. I'm asking you, Lord God, um, to increase their faith. And for those that need faith, give them a gift of faith, Lord God. Um, according to your word. So, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we adore you in Jesus' name, Yeshua. Amen and amen, and we seal it in the blood. Well, thank you for coming on tonight, beloved. Remember, it's almost midnight, and the bride, the church, must make herself, get herself ready. Amen. Love you. God bless you. And see you. You on Friday, God.